Hi there, Sylvia here. Today I'm going to be interviewing Jim Bruton. He had a near-death experience and he's also the author of the book In Between A Trip of a Lifetime. He'll talk about uh, what happened when he was in his coma. It's quite fascinating. He's also an Emmy Award winning documentary producer and he'll talk a little bit about that and his um, time in Africa. It's a fascinating story. If you like this video, hit like. You can comment below and I would love for you to subscribe so I can create more of these videos for you. Hi Sylvia, thanks for having me today. Uh, yeah, I mean it, it's been a pretty amazing ride. Uh, I was living in southwestern Africa, a country called Namibia, which means the big nothing and it really is. 300 miles from anywhere, uh, filming um, for various markets. A lot of it was European television, but we did do some American television. Uh, I was finishing up a documentary for National Geographic for which I won an Emmy and a Disney film crew came out during that time and they had a sort of a prototype almost satellite telephone and I looked at it and thought about how to transmit video over that because I could just see how that could extend our ability to tell the story in real time and so I was the first in the world to figure out how to do that which essentially was like shrinking a television truck into a backpack. And once we refined that and waited for some new digital satellites to launch, um, my first real paying gig with it was uh, to transmit live video from the summit of Mount Everest for the King of Malaysia and his Everest team. And then I integrated it with telemedical applications destined for the space station. I was a lecturer at Yale University School of Medicine for that. But it wasn't until I had my near-death experience that I really felt compelled to do it. I think before, I just didn't want to write another one of those books, you know, the, the men's journal cover where you're standing there with your arms <laughs> crossed and elephants are fighting in the background or something. I thought, you know, there have been enough stories like that. And I'm rather self-effacing by nature, to be honest. With my near-death experience, the story itself of that just felt like it was pushing out of me, like it wanted to come out of my pores. Telling all the other stuff, the pre-NDE stuff of, you know, the travel, the adventure and all that, mm -hmm. That just puts it in context because as blessedly unusual as my life was before the near-death experience, my near-death experience is also pretty unique. So, you know, why get normal now, right? All right. So take us to the day where you had the near-death experience. Sure. Um, I met a widow with three babies and uh, call it the day I left the war business and joined the circus. On that day, I... Uh, <laughs> I, uh, my, my new wife said, now that you're not traveling, you know, so that you don't get on my nerves, why don't you build those airplanes you've always talked about? Well, I always had a love of old aviation, like World War I from mm -hmm. essentially 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. So I did. I built a World War I fighter, and that worked out really well. And then I built a tiny, whimsical-looking plane called a Flying Flea. If you can imagine a soapbox derby car with a wing above your head and one right behind your head, and a motorcycle engine right in front of your face, you have the idea. It looks like something out of a Disney cartoon. It was a, a reproduction of a 1933 French flying fleet. So it was on my second test flight that I lost my engine. It just stopped. And I wasn't able to make it back to the airfield in time. So instead, I was aiming for a small lake at a nearby Boy Scout camp. I overshot the lake. Now, again, imagine crashing into tree trunks at 70 miles an hour in a soapbox derby car, and you have the idea. Uh, when I finished crashing, there was no airplane left around me. It was all matchsticks. I had broken all my ribs, ruptured both lungs. My right leg had multiple fractures, a hole in my lower back. It was pretty bad. I, I, but I, I'm fond of saying other than that, I was fine. Um, <laughs> luckily, a man was fishing nearby and called 911. And it turned out he was a retired police officer. So he'd seen trauma, you know, traffic accidents and things like this. So he was able to not freak out and keep me propped up until the medevac a helicopter landed and was able to extract me and take me up to the Hartford Connecticut Trauma Center. So you're in a coma and you wake up and you're in a new reality. Tell us how you felt and what you saw around you. It was like again being teleported. You know some near-death experiences talk about going through a tunnel. I Mine was more like teleportation. I was just there. I was up on the terrace of, a, I would say, a very tall building, but it was in a post-apocalyptic landscape. Uh, as I've said in other times, imagine a large city uh, after a nuclear blast or a 
meteor strike or something like that. But this is thousands of years after that. I mean, absolutely dead city, no sound of any type. And as I looked out, I all of a sudden was hit by this wave of nausea and doubled over in pain. And in my head, it was like I said out loud, I don't think I can stand this. And when I did, I heard something off to my left and not too far away was a, a large egg shaped structure, like a sculpture made out of lattice work that was egg shaped standing on its end. And within I could see um, slight movements and that it was this sound, it was like a, a whispering of clacking ears. And I made my way over to it. And as I looked in the, um, through the lattice work, I could see these gears just sort of freely suspended in air, sometimes moving through each other. And they were in various views of, or various degrees of focus. Some were very crystal clear and some were more ghost-like. So everything about it was physically impossible. And there were a special kind of gear called a sector gear. It's a partial arc of a fully round gear. And you see them in clocks or clock-like mm -hmm. mechanisms. Mm -hmm. There is an incredible amount of logic after the fact and the analysis that goes into why they were those particular kind of gears. It's fascinating. It's, it's outlined in my book. But anyway, as I looked at them, uh, even though the different gears were in various degrees of focus, what they meant, what they represented was very clear. And I was seeing images from my future, you know, because I might see myself and I'm looking older, something like that, or, you know, a child with now children. Mm -hmm. And I, um, as I saw them, I put my hand through the lattice work to just see, gosh, can I touch these? And as I did, one gear brushed by my hand. And I was immediately racked again with this nausea, this stomach pain. Reflexively, I grabbed it, pulled it out through the lattice work and threw it away. And then all of the gears started recycling. And that's when I said, what is this thing? And a disembodied voice that stayed with me throughout the entire experience said, this is the process of becoming. And, you know, we continue to have a conversation throughout my time there in which I think some of the most profound things that have ever been said to me were spoken. I want to know what they were. <laughs> okay, great. Well, I said, um, you know, what is this place? And it said, you're in the in-between. I said, in between what? And it said, everything. You are standing inside the eternity of a single moment. And I said, what does that mean? It said, oh, wow, wow. Uh, it said, do you remember the world to which your body belongs? And I said, no, I can't. It said, then you see the truth and how the past is dust. And I said, well, you know, what are these gears? And it said, they're all representations of thoughts, words, or deeds from your future. And I said, well, how did I know I could remove that one gear? And it literally said, why else are you here? And I said, I don't even know what this place is. And that's when it said, you're in the impossible now, standing inside the eternity of a single moment. And I, um, that, that's I, yeah. pretty, that's pretty deep, Jim. <laughs> that's like, Oh well, yeah, we were, we were on a roller coaster ride here to, you know, get right down to the nitty gritty. And I, um, I remember asking, you know, why do some of these gears hurt me? And it said, well, some choices that, or in your future will be to your, sp your uh, spiritual detriment. Essentially, it was telling me, you're here for what in whatever way you want to measure in a short period of time. Your mission is to remove future choices that will be to your spiritual detriment. It's kind of like stacking the deck, right? <laughs> because, because think about it. I mean, we're all, each moment has an infinity infinitude of choices we can make that will take us off in various directions and have different repercussions. Mm -hmm. Some of these choices will be unfortunate and some will not. And it was saying the pain each brings is your guide, you know, the law of unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. So I asked, you know, where, where are the gears that feel good? And it said, <laughs> I know, right? It said, you're not here to feel good. Again, it wasn't a threat. It's just, you're here on a mission and I even felt badly and said so that I, I, I felt sad that I wasn't using a moral compass to make those choices. I was using pain. Mm -hmm. But I was told, too, that the, the reason pain works so well was, and you can imagine this, that if I had seen 
some of those choices, what they represented, I could have well gotten into an argument about keeping them. Like, I want to win the lottery, no matter that it said I was going to be the biggest jerk that ever were. I won't be the big jerk. But you know what? We didn't have a lot of time for argument. So why don't you just take the pain that might come from having gone down that road and let that be your guide? It's inarguable. Wow. So I just kept feeling around uh, over and over and over again to find a gear uh, within that egg that caused pain and remove it. And then, you know, it was all this recycling of the gears. And I said, why does it do that? And it said, your future has to reset itself around a destiny that it's not meant to be. I said, okay, great. Um, anyway, I just kind of kept continuing doing that and we kept talking. And at one point I saw this huge pile of gears <laughs> growing that I'd thrown out. And I said, am I going to live, you know, a shorter time for doing all this? And it said, your number of breaths are already counted. I will worry about your last one. Wow. And I love said, that. Oh, it was, it was amazing. And, and at one time I said, uh, you know, I don't know how comforting that is. And it said, eliminating bad choices doesn't mean you won't make wrong ones. Right and wrong are variables over which you have no control. And mm -hmm. the answers of what comes next are also a waste. It's better to see the pattern of how things fit and refit together. And I think you were talking to the same guy that I was talking to because that's what he said. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised, Sylvia. I, 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 think, I think many of us do come from the same planet after an experience like that speak in the same language. And it's amazing when you talk to someone who has had a I'll say not, it may not be a similar experience, it may be the exact same experience, but you're on the other side of something than I am. And now we put the pieces together. Yeah. That when we start describing it with the same terms mm -hmm. that we learned within, mm -hmm. now that's pretty significant to me. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that in-between place was just a moment frozen so that you could reconfigure and recalibrate yourself and your life. And then you would move from that spot. Where do you think that in between place was? I think you've asked a, a quite a very brilliant question with a lot of different aspects to it. The, I think I was on the causal plane. According to um, a lot of belief systems, you know, there are higher planes beyond here on the way to whatever we want to call heaven. And, uh, typically, like over in India, it might be, you know, the physical, astral, causal, super causal, oh, and you're out of here. And a lot, a lot of people go to the astral, and it's beautiful and everything. But I'm pretty sure, for me, it was the causal, because it was all about cause and effect. It was all about seeing the pattern and the interconnectivity between things that originate and things that end. And that that's how I feel about it. And also, I think in terms of the magnitude of some of the after effects and, and some of the things I have been working through with integration, that speaks to how deeply within I went. Mm -hmm. That's not meant to sound like I'm bragging. Uh, it's not, it's been more, it's actually been more like, you know, ways in which it's been a challenge to remain attached to my relationships in the world. Let's talk about that. So you came out of it and I mean, unless there's more there, but. There are two things I'd like to share yes, from there. Please. One was, I said, you know, this fixing my future is painful. And, you know, it's, you know, I talked about the moral compass and the pain. And it said, uh, removing your enthusiasm to further chain yourself to the world is less painful than the crushing weight of those chains once forged around you. And I said, what am I missing here? And it said, what is clearly before you? Grace. No one deserves salvation. It can only be given by grace. But you can, um, let me just see what that last sentence was. But it, you have to choose it at the expense of the world that separates us. And the final thing really that I would share was that, um, I said, it's, it's like this place was designed so I can do one thing and one thing only. And the, <laughs> the end in between said, if those with choices make poor use of them, then offering fewer possibilities could be called mercy. Oh my gosh. Sometimes things are so bizarre, like you saw all those gears, and it, it probably made perfect sense when you were there. So 
when you're in a position where you're making poor choices and life isn't working for you, things start to feel cut off and they do become cut off probably for self-preservation. So you can stop yourself from hurting yourself and others. Do you think that? I think it, I could, it may even be more subtle than that sometimes because, you know, having been a spiritually inclined person before, obviously I would measure loss with that filter. It's not like I was, you know, as concerned perhaps about my material welfare. But anyway, that, that's what I was told. So obviously using that as my main filter and my the main focus of my work there, I think that's what came. And as I was wrapping up, said, you know, you can't change the past, but you can make better choices in the future. And to be gentle with everyone as I am gentle with you. And I said, well, what's gentle about all this? <laughs> And literally it said, you prayed for something for which being here is the answer. And now the man who fell from the sky is not the same who flew into it. And with that, I was pretty much kicked out and here I am. Wow. And your life is forever changed. And in the ways of what happened in the immediate time when you came back as this new gym. Yeah, I call it, you know, it, to me, it's like before it was Jim 1.0, then then there was the reboot, and now I'm Jim 2.0. <laughs> because when I uh, came out of my comb and everything, I'd say it was about another week after that before I really had much of a memory, I saw this picture taped to the wall that my wife taped, and it was of me in Afghanistan with the Northern Alliance. Uh, I'm going to put that picture up here. I'm going to splice it in right now. Okay, great. Uh, and, you know, to her, that was the best version of myself. You know, it was a perfect match.com picture, and, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> for a wide <laughs> But when I looked at that picture, I just more or less was thinking, who is that? That's not me anymore. That man died in a crash. And so getting to know the new improved version of Jim has been what I've been doing every day since then. And that that is a huge part of the integration work after near death experience is realizing that you react to things differently, that your values are different. Um, you know, in terms of marriages, 65 to 78% of them end in divorce. Uh, it's, it's just overwhelming. It, there are no good or bad people about this. It's just overwhelming and people don't have a common reference point. Uh, religion eh, it does a little bit of a good job, but as a, as a Dalai Lama himself said one time, Religion is the tip of the finger. Spirituality is the moon to which the finger points. Mm -hmm. Not important where you begin. It's more important where you end up. And mm -hmm. that's the path. So, you know, it was interesting laying in the hospital uh, as I came, like I said, came to, all of a sudden the memory started to descend upon me of, of the in-between. And it was cyclic. It's almost like I'm going over and over and over again. And it, with each iteration, there was a deepening of meaning and detail in this conversation, which really was a part of me. So I asked for my computer to be brought from home. I started typing up my story right away. It's been interesting to go back and see those initial versions. And if I were to say, in terms of after effects, as you know, a lot of people who weren't psychic before are psychic after. And if they were psychic, they're more so after. I would say, my superpower, if you will, is empathy, um, connecting to people. Now, I think that's a fairly common one with us because we've been to this place of where, where interconnectivity is part of the air you breathe there, so to speak. It's, it's woven into the fabric of that universe. So when you freshly come back from that place, you still have some of that glow and aura around you. Just like right now, if you got off a jet having had a great safari in Kenya, people mm -hmm. Feel it. They want to hear all about it. They want to be in that space. They want to project their minds off into Africa, things like that. Similar experience here. And so everyone in the hospital was incredibly nice to me. Um, my, I was told my near-death experience for the first time to my nurse in the morning, and she started crying. And I said, why are you crying? She said, I don't want you to die. And I said, well, you're a nurse in the hospital. You see this all the time. She goes, yeah, but you're magical. She said, everybody gets one doctor a day for 15 minutes. For some reason, you have three to five doctors in here, up to an hour and a half, talking about all sorts of things other than your medical case. And one wants you in business with him so badly, he has you on international conference calls at night with your leg up in an air in a cage, 
doped up on painkillers. To the, I've never ever seen anything like this. And I would say that sense of connectivity has it continues to this day. Now, when I go out and present my story and share it with others, sometimes it just fills the room. And I won't say anything about that, but people come up afterwards and say, you know, we really felt something. And I'm saying, yeah. It's, uh, I should mention that people can see you at the third annual near death experience. And I'm going to put a link down below uh, for your free ticket there. And are you speaking at any other conferences that we should? Right. Um, because I was wrapping up my first book, I, I didn't have a chance to um, submit a paper to IANS for their international, well, for their, I guess it's going to be an online conference for this year, but I did speak last year and that's where I got a lot of initiative for writing my book. Uh, so right now, that's the only big workshop I'm scheduled for. However, I'll, I'll be at um, the largest book festival in the world in Guadalajara in December. Oh, and, that's great. December yeah. of 2020? Say again? December 2020? Yes, exactly. Okay. And uh, so right now I'm focused really on my second book, uh, my agent is working on some speaking engagements. I've had a ton of interviews that I'm really enjoying. I have some questions for you. So sure. um, two of them. One is about letting go that we talked about earlier before the interview. And the other one is, do you think at nighttime that you're still going to other planes of existence? Do you ever have the feeling that you've gone somewhere, learned something, done something, and then come back? Or do you feel that that, that part has been sealed off? No. For now? You had the most insightful questions. I've just got goosebumps when you <laughs> asked that. No, I absolutely do go whether it's back to the in-between or somewhere else. Yeah. And sometimes it's not that I come back with all these memories. It's like as soon as, you know, and so many of us wake up at two in the morning or three in the morning or something like that. And maybe we go back to sleep and maybe we don't. But every time I do, I know I've been somewhere because of the way my mind works. Mm -hmm. I, at that point, I cannot think in a linear fashion. I can only think in a non-linear fashion. The difference being, you know, linear is A, B, C, D. You know, if you've completed A, you move to B. Whereas a non-linear approach looks for moving patterns of information so that it can see multiple inference points to understanding a solution uh, or understanding a problem with a solution. It's very much about patterns. Mm -hmm. And when this has happened to me in the middle of the night, I realized that I can't... Um, proceduralized things. For instance, one night, these tree limbs, the shadows of them were dancing on a black wardrobe uh, here in New England when I was very windy. And as I watched them, all of a sudden they translated into something like a, a movie. I know that sounds so strange right there, but as I watched it, I knew it, there was a story somehow playing out here. But in a non-linear mind, you can't watch a movie. You know, a, a movie may be uh, 25 frames per second, and each frame is a little photograph. Mm -hmm. So it's like watching it one frame at a time. And I can't remember the frame before, and I can't anticipate the frame forward because I'm so present. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's like taking an amnesiac to the movies. It might be entertaining for a couple minutes, and it'd probably be pretty irritating. But if you shift back into the linear mind, you can understand it. As you know, we could, we could download a three hour or two hour movie right now in about two minutes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Look at it on the nonlinear side. It's a jumble of ones and zeros. If you look at it on the linear side, it translates in through a media player to something with a beginning, middle and end. What do you think your purpose is? Now that's a very open loaded question because there's the humanitarian type purpose for you being here. And then your personal purpose, either one, whichever one you want to answer. Why are you here? Sure. Thank you. Well, you know, it's interesting. I, I sort of backed into that from working on answering the question of the meaning of life, because the meaning of life could be a bit general, but the purpose of life is very individual specific. And so we back into our lives and say, okay, what are my particular talents that I've been given? And I would say my guiding light on how to best answer what my purpose here is, I want to help. It's like love all, serve all. Mm -hmm. And so right now, because of the way the world is unfolding before me, where my opportunities exist, and the encouragement I'm getting from so many wonderful people like yourself, Sylvia, who basically show up out of nowhere and say, I want to help you. 
And that's what we're doing right now is to simply share my experience and see what people draw from that. Because here in this life, we see life through the filters we want. On the other side, we see life through the filters we need. And that's why those experiences are so tailor-made to us individually. I mean, there's, there's no reason, basically, this shouldn't be a party. I mean, why not? You know, we've come down here to have, again, are we human beings trying to have a spiritual experience or are we spiritual beings having a human experience? If we can remember our spirituality, and this is where the art of letting go comes in, rather than chasing that one more thing that we'll be chasing with our last breath and still not have enough. Just so that our audience gets this because you're very, very quick. So letting go, the art of letting go, the art of letting go is freedom. Explain why letting go is freedom and explain that chasing thing and how no matter how much of it that you get, it, you just won't get enough. Exactly. I have a three sentence story that will explain about letting go on a deeply intuitive level. There's an old saying that on the field of battle, when a samurai, you know, the Japanese swordsman, mm -hmm. when the samurai draws his sword, and throws his scabbard away, it's because he will no longer need it. On this day, he's free to fight his best. Oh, I love that. Just love it. You will no longer need those things. And that is the art of letting go. Don't bring me to tears, Jim. Just <laughs> well, it's <laughs> you know, one of the things the in-between told me was always live life in celebration of the individual spirit. For no one and no thing can stand before the brilliance of a truly naked soul. This is letting go. Let the world chase that one more thing. It's a distraction. And other people are the ones who are profiting from it, not the seeker. But if we start to let go, we start to realize we already have everything we need to be happy spiritual beings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you start to reharmonize your life to the natural order of things, synchronicities become more the norm than the exception. And those synchronicities are what are constantly remind us that there's more to this than what we would think there is. I think there's a lot of weight to your words, and I'd like to back it up by saying, think of this. Um, the earth, you have oxygen, you have water, you have trees, you have fruits from the trees, you have stuff that grows. We literally have every single thing we could ever need without even doing anything ever. So we do have that, but then we just fester in this um, insatiable obsession of um, compulsion. And letting go is so freeing. And it just letting go. It, it's true. <laughs> All right. Yeah, well, thank you so much. I loved having you here. Um, I was looking forward to it for a long time. I don't know if you knew that, but I'd. Uh, <laughs> thank you so yeah, and um, I hope to have you back again. And I just want to remind everybody to get your book in between a trip of a lifetime. Check out his website too. He's got a lot of awesome stuff.